Hey everybody, how you doing? This is about to be a really fun video. Give me 20 seconds to make sure everything's up and going. Make sure I clicked all the right buttons. You guys watch the show. No, I'm not a super tech guy, but yeah, it says we're live. I'm looking kind of fuzzy, but I'm going to bring in our special guest tonight, a good friend of mine. We actually met face to face for the first time a little over a year ago, hunted together. Good buddy of mine, super, super knowledgeable about a whole lot of things, which is why we're bringing him on the show tonight. Let me introduce to you my good friend, Mr. John McAdams from the Big Game Hunting Blog. So give us a 30-second spiel on who you are and, and what you do. Adam, good to see you again. It's been a while since we talked. I had a good time with you in Colorado. I was just thinking about that hunt the other day and how much fun it was being up there. But uh, yeah, name is John McAdams. I have the Big Game Hunting blog, the Big Game Hunting podcast. I know there are some people that watch your YouTube channel that also subscribe to mine and listen to my podcast. Yep. But Same. there's also a lot of, lot of people that uh, may not know who I am. You know, you and I did a YouTube live uh, 11 months ago. <laughs> so if they missed that, may not might not have seen me. But I've I don't know. Maybe the thing that I'm most famous for is writing caliber comparisons, the 270 versus the 30 out six and the 65 Creedmoor versus the 308 and that sort of thing. And so I do a lot of real in-depth, deep dives into those sort of uh, subject matter, both on my blog and on my podcast and on my YouTube channel. It's a lot of the same sort of stuff just presented in, in different ways there. I'm a total nerd when it comes down to uh, external ballistics and terminal ballistics. It's something I think is fascinating. And it's always fun for me to have those sort of discussions with people like you. Absolutely. And I'm sitting here writing down a note here, something I just thought to ask you here in a second. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think, so it, let me pause for a second. Everybody make sure I pinned it in the chat. I pinned it in the description of the YouTube video. I pinned it in the first comment of the YouTube video. Make sure that you're subscribed to his YouTube channel. There's a bunch of free knowledge on there. And from there, I'm sure you can. they can find your website, and yeah, there's links to all that on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on your newsletter, and I read every single one. Some of them are quite interesting. I responded to one the other day, and we had a little bit of back and forth on it. Uh, but lots of good stuff, uh, especially if you subscribe to his newsletter. He's always putting out uh, content on that thing. But if I recall, if my memory is right, how I first found you, I was on a road trip. And looking for <laughs> things to listen to on YouTube. And I had just bought a 300 rum. Mm. And one of your caliber comparison videos that I think it was, it's 300 Win Mag, 300 rum, maybe, and a couple of other I things. think it was about the 300 rum. And I talk about how it compared to the 300 Win Mag. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's how I first found you. And then when we went hunting last year in Colorado, I saw your face and it took me a minute. And I'm like, <laughs> I've, I've seen this guy's face somewhere and then it finally clicked. Uh, but we've got tons of stuff to talk about tonight. Let's start off with, we haven't connected since like a week ago when we were texting or emailing back and forth. You just mm -hmm. went on a hunting trip last week. How did that go? That hunting trip was unfortunately kind of a bust. I got uh, kind of skunked with just a combination of rough conditions and bad weather out there. You know, so I live down in Texas and we're in the middle, we're coming towards the end of a, just a nasty, hot, dry summer here. And it's so bad that a lot of the oak trees are dropping their acorns early. Like normally we've not got that here. We've got yeah, that here right. too. So, you know, I'm not used to having the acorns start dropping in September uh, like this. That's normally a November, December sort of thing. And yep. uh, so I was hunting um, axis deer out in central Texas. And um, as is the case in, a, in uh, a lot of these sort of places out there, hunting over feeders and everything, very common in Texas. And uh, like the first night I was there, so I get in Friday, hunt Friday evening and sitting over the feeder and some animals come into the feeder. And we're like, okay, no problem. It's probably just been really hot today, not moving. We'll see what the deal is tomorrow. And it just got worse and worse every day. And then like one day we just happened to see a group of black buck going and eating underneath a tree and then moving from that tree to the next tree. And we're like, those are oak trees. They're eating all the acorns mm -hmm. on the ground under it and nothing's coming to the feeders right now. 
And so we spent the last two days trying to do spot and stalk and whatnot out there and try and catch them. And we saw a ton of animals out there, a ton of black buck, uh, a lot of uh, axis deer, fallow, a lot of the stuff that you'd see in uh, uh, you know, the hill country of Texas like that. But uh, the area was so thick that it was hard to get a shot on things. You would um, maybe catch some movement and then move over, get ready to get a shot, and something to see you, and they'd all take off running. Uh, that sort of thing and so um and then my last night there we had a nasty storm come through and lightning was striking all around us we're like okay we're just gonna call it quit for tonight and, and we'll try again tomorrow and then the next day got got four inches of rain that night and turned everything oh, wow. into just a, just a mess so the um i don't know if the drought is still officially on or anything but it ended in a giant mess so i got a rain check and i'm gonna come back and we're gonna try and finish up that hunt on a, on a better note uh, at some point in the future when conditions may be a little better. <laughs> uh, I have literally had the exact same experience. I went to Yavalde and this has been about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was the, I was hunting with another guy and it was a high fence place that was 300 some acres. Mm -hmm. And this guy's showing me trail camera picture after picture of these just monster axis bucks. He's like, ah, oh, we got, you know, 200 some inside the fence. Like, you're going to get one of these big ones. That's guaranteed. I hunted three days, like sun up to sundown, and I did not lay eyeballs on a single axis deer. Jeez. We, we checked the trail camera pics, and sure enough, like, they're here. This guy's not pulling my leg. But even though it was only 300 some acres, couldn't find them. Tried everything. Same thing. Feeders, spot and stalk, literally walking the entire thing in a grid like we're going to push them at some point and i didn't even see one for three days but it, i literally I, had had the exact same experience i was surprised at how both how skittish and how how shy they were and uh you know like i had heard that they were you know they like to move at night and whatnot but in my mind i was thinking okay you know that's like white tails right you know they'll move uh, it's not uncommon for them to move at night, but they'll also move a little bit in the morning and the evening and that sort of thing. And yeah. that'll be when it's most productive. And, and that was, was the case. We were getting a tiny bit of movement with them early in the morning and late in the evening. Uh, but it just, it just wasn't enough. And, uh, I wasn't, wasn't there quite long enough with good weather. And, uh, I just kind of struck out, but you know, who knows how it goes, right? You go back to the same place at the right time of year, you may shoot something really nice that first afternoon. You know? Yeah. Mm hmm we actually have been super dry here. We had a pouring rain for about an hour this afternoon, which I was happy to get. I put in food plots almost a month ago, and almost nothing has come up yet. Jeez, so man. Well, I, I hope need that, rain bad. Yeah, I hope that turns around for you. Well, see, I bought a sprayer so I could make it rain myself and water these food plots, like a tank sprayer for a side-by-side -side or an ATV or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just rains the same day that my sprayer shows up. So, it's kinda... <laughs> but it's probably going to be dry for the next week or two anyway. So we'll we'll use it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just got my security alarm went off on my front door. Surely that's my wife. Yeah, she's out there doing something. Uh, but uh, nobody's robbing my house. Well, good. Uh, go ahead. What were you about to say? Well, but aside from the bad luck on my my recent hunt, um, you know, the you know the hunting since you and I last talked has been pretty good. You know, we talked about uh, my trip to Africa and uh, that it went on back in May, and then that big hog I shot here, I guess it was a month ago. I Man, just I've been so busy, it, it uh, time just flies sometimes. But uh, those, that was some real good uh, stuff right there. So hopefully the access was just a little bit of an, an, an anomaly. So let let's talk about the Africa trip. Where did you go? What did you use? What did you shoot? Sure. So I, uh, like you and I have talked, I got a lot of irons in the fire, right? I got the blog, I got the podcast, and I have my own booking agency where I book for an outfitter over there. And so I try and work, have all these things kind of work in uh, parallel uh, with each other. And so this one was actually a podcast hunt that I went on in Africa, went over with two guys that were podcast listeners. They went and hunted with me with my outfitter Ooh. in Africa. So that was a lot of fun. And I did actually a similar deal with a Sandhill crane hunt in uh, West Texas back in January. So there were six of us that went on that hunt. That was a weekend hunt just out here in Abilene. 
and it was it was a lot of fun. Great guys out there, excellent hunting. And so we just kind of took that to the next level going to Africa for, for nine days like that. And I was a little nervous going into it, right? You talk to these guys on the phone and email them and, and all that. And like, they sound cool that way, but you never know what someone's going to be like until you until you spend yeah. over a week with them. But both both guys turned out to be awesome guys. Uh, one guy from Canada, one guy from Mexico. So we had all three countries, North wow. America represented. And uh, I was over there primarily focused on trying to get these guys a good hunt because it was both of their first trip over there. And they ended up having a fantastic time shooting buffalo, sable, kudu, zebra, gimsbach, impala. I mean, they, they got a lot of stuff. Um, I took Ooh. my um, Christensen Arms Ridgeline in 7 millimeter PRC over there. And believe it or not, that was my fifth trip to Africa. And I never killed a blue wildebeest before. So that was one of the things I wanted. I was like, I want a good blue wildebeest. And so we were in the Limpopo province of South Africa. That is in the, if you just look at a map of South Africa, it's in the northeast part of the country. And um, that part that just kind of sticks up off to the side like that, up with Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. So I was right on the border with uh, Botswana. Beautiful country there. Fantastic kudu hunting, impala, blue wildebeest, a lot of other stuff, but that's the the three main things there. And so, like I said, I really wanted this blue wildebeest. The other guys had never been before, uh, so they they had their list of things that they wanted, but you know, just a lot more target opportunity there when you've literally yeah. not hunted anything that's uh, that's been there before. So I was kind of putting them first, and they were having a great time and all that, and I finally, about middle of the hunt, I got a line on a, on a really nice uh, blue wildebeest. And it was, we like, they'd, they'd been there the whole time and we'd been seeing them and trying to put a stock on them, but it just wasn't working out. And for whatever reason, things changed for all three of us that day. We all ended up shooting wildebeest that same day. And uh, the weather, a little bit of a weather front came through that day. And so for whatever reason, that changed their behavior enough that they went from being real skittish and not being where they're easy to get to, to there's being a completely different situation and right at dusk that night we spotted one that was a real nice bull by himself and i ended up having to sprint about 400 yards to get into position Ooh. on this blue wildebeest before it got dark and i had a loophole vx5 on my rifle and it had the fire dot reticle that little red dot right yep. in the center of the crosshairs and i I, I looked above the, the scope and I could see him barely. I just see a black shape out there with my naked eye. I looked through the scope and he's just c- clear as could be, but I couldn't see the crosshairs. So I just turned on that red dot and he, he was standing with his rear end facing me. And he was eating and didn't look like he was in a, a, a hurry to move. And I didn't have time to move anymore at this point. I was like, we got to shoot now or we got to pass it. And he looked back at me. And he kind of just stared at me for just, you know, 30 seconds and put his head back down and started eating again. And I said to myself, okay, if he does that again, I'm going to shoot him in the head. And he was only about 80 yards away. And he looked the other way this time over his other side. And I put the crosshairs right behind, uh, right, basically where his head joined his neck and squeezed the trigger. And he just dropped like a, like a ton of bricks Mm. like that. And that was really nice, right? I've worked so hard to get that blue wildebeest. I've had kind of a tough one up until that point, but man, it was just, just light, lights turned off. And uh, I never would have thought that that would have been how that I would have uh, killed the blue wildebeest. And they're especially known for being really, really tough. Poor man's buffalo is what they're known for. And it's unusual to have one, have you shoot one and have it, have it uh, drop like that. They usually run. And sometimes you got to shoot them more than once. And sometimes they'll go a long way, all that. Uh, but it just worked out where I got that perfect opportunity right on the spine, and and that was the end of it. And so that was uh, that was one of the animals they ended up getting over there with that seven PRC, and it was you know, it was fantastic. So I got to ask the question: Were you using the ELDX bullet, or what were you using? So I was using the one sixty CX bullet. They're they're copper bullet. They're equivalent so of the lighter one. Yeah, the lighter. I have I haven't been able to find any of that stuff yet. You I've know, seen I it got, on their website, but I haven't shot it. I got really lucky as I was like this whole prep for the hunt was kind of kind of just just a whirlwind because I wanted to bring a seven PRC, but because it was so new, it was hard to get stuff for it. And yep. so I was looking, looking, looking. Yeah, that was that was months ago. Yeah, yeah, I was there in May. Yeah, yeah. So it was brand brand new then. Um, 
first time I was able to find the ammo for it was in uh, late March uh, for it. And so, but I was looking and I found that Sportsman's Guide actually had the ELD Match, the Precision Hunter, and the CX, the Outfitter line with the CX ammo in stock. I don't know if they still do, but they did then. And so I bought a bunch of it all. And um, I got this rifle. I bought it on Gunbroker. I got it like the, the next day I took it to the range and started sighting it in. And that rifle I really needed to break in the barrel. It shot like garbage when I first started shooting it. I mean, it was, it was shooting a group this big at 100 yards. But I followed their barrel break-in procedure to a T. And it was a pain in the rear doing it. But, man, like the more I did it, just those groups just shrunk down. And I, was, I could cover up my, a three-shot group with a nickel uh, by the time I went to Africa. And that's how it's still nice. shooting now. So now, you know, now that that's done, you only got to do it once, pain in the rear, but, uh, but now it's done. And so fortunately I was able to get those CX bullets. And fortunately they shot really well for me too. <laughs> and they, and they worked great on the hunt. Sweet. Mm -hmm. it, one of my seven PRCs does the match and the ELDX great, like half inch groups. But and then I had another one that did okay with the match, but would not shoot the ELDX at all. Interesting. Like three inch groups over Man. and over and over again. Uh, but I actually just got that one back. It's sitting right here. Uh, so hopefully it's doing better now. But had to get some more work done on seven it. PRC. Well, yeah, yeah I, actually, that one was a Ruger. I sent it to Ruger, and they kind of said, yeah. Our results were pretty much the same. It shoots match good and not ELDX is good. But then they like found a defect in it and just ended up sending me a new one. So oh, it's a right. completely different rifle. Well, good. We'll see how this new one works for you then. Yeah, hopefully uh, good. I got to get a scope for it now because I robbed the scope for something else already. <laughs> I've been swapping scopes around like crazy too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so I shot that blue wildebeest with that. And then I also shot an Impala. And, um, in, right, Impala are like the size of deer, right? They're not super hard to kill or anything. And shooting a blue wildebeest at 80 yards is not something you need anything super high tech or sexy to, to do. You just got to be able to put that bullet where it belongs. Lots of guys use a 30 out six on it and it works great. But it was still cool to do it with that that new uh, new cartridge. And that rifle was the FFT version from Christensen Arms. And so it was so light, such a joy to carry out there. Wow. A 20, uh, 22 inch barrel on it too. So it was pretty compact and, uh, just, just a, a big improvement from some of the other rifles that I've used. It's just been a whole lot bigger than that, uh, lately. And so when I shot that Impala with it, once again, not a real long shot, like 70 yards and it was broadside and I just hammered it right behind the shoulder. And, uh, it, it actually blew one of his lungs out of the body, uh, on, oh. out of the exit side. And he went 10 yards and, and that was the end of that. So, uh, same bullet. Through, Yep, same 160 CX, yeah. Mm. But that was that was a whole lot of fun over there. Great rifle, great company um, doing that. It's always great being in Africa. Just incredible experience where you get to see so much stuff over there. Even things that you're not necessarily going to hunt, just like the birds, monkeys, you got crocodiles and hippo in the river, jackal, hyena, like all that stuff. And then, of course, you got like, Almost anywhere you go in South Africa, you're going to have several different species you can hunt too. And I think this place, there's around 15 <laughs> species there, uh, wow. ranging ranging from steenbok and diker, which are about 30 pounds on the small end. And then it gets bigger with warthog, blessbok, impala, blue wildebeest, gimsbok, zebra, kudu, eland. And eland is going to be the size of a Cape buffalo. Like the whole way big. Through. Yeah, they'll weigh 2,000 pounds. Yeah, so you have literally everything from 20, 30 pounds up to 2,000 pounds in that same area. And you'll see darn near all of it over the course of a, of a hunt there, just messing around out there. So, I mean, I've got a million questions about Africa. I've, I've never been. So when you when you typically do that, are you, I'm assuming you're hunting someone else's private land. How does that all work out? Yeah, so it depends on where exactly in Africa you're hunting. In South Africa, there's a lot of private land that you're hunting on. Um, say, going back to the apartheid era, era there, so pre-1994, um, in South Africa, they had a lot of economic sanctions put upon them. And so they were having to be almost completely self-sufficient with ranching, growing food, things mm. like that and everything. 
And then when apartheid ended, they were like, you know, we can convert a lot of this area from farmland back to wildland. And, so, and a lot of areas were never converted to farmland or anything uh, in, in the first place. But it is not uncommon to run into places that 30 years ago had cattle on them or were growing corn or something like that. And now you got a multi thousand acre uh, area there. Sometimes they still even call it a farm where they brought back the native wildlife uh, that, that used to live there before they, they extirpated it many years ago. And so that's pretty common. There's a lot of places, like I said, though, that were, you know, they were just never, uh, never developed. You know, it still looks, you know, pretty much the same there now as it did a hundred years ago, that sort of thing. Um, uh, terrain really varies in South Africa from um, flat, almost wide open deserts or areas that would look a lot like Wyoming, like the Eastern Wyoming uh, to straight up mountains, to what you would think of as a jungle or something like that. Other places look a lot like South Texas or Southern Arizona, Southern New Mexico. Go to different countries, you'll be on government land. So it's not really public land, but it's government land that a hunting outfitter has leased the hunting rights from the government. So it may be, I don't know, gotcha. 10,000, 50,000 acres, something like that. So uh, sometimes, so it's weird. It's not like hunting a national forest here in some of those places where Sometimes you, you'll be the only hunter there, but sometimes you'll run into just a village out in the middle of this area where they they live there, they run their cattle there and all that stuff. Um, and you're kind of hunting around them and um, you're, you're working this interface between the people interacting with the wildlife and them getting into their crops and them not liking it versus uh, realizing that they get paid for it and they get jobs associated with the hunting. And so there's the big conservation aspect of it there. And then in some of these countries too, once again, there's areas that were just never developed. No one lives there. It's not strictly a national park per se, but it's something like that that's been preserved. And it really is uh, just a kind of a big wide open area like that where, you know, you go hunt. So you have just kind of the whole gamut of stuff going on in Africa and it all depends on exactly where, with who, and for what you're hunting. Gotcha. So, and for somebody like me who doesn't have a clue about Africa, that's one of the things that you do is help people through mm -hmm. that process. So can you give us a quick spiel about what that would look like if I emailed you and said, hey, man, I don't know what I'm talking about. Can you help me with some with an African hunt? What would yeah. that look like? Yeah. So, you know, quite often, you know, sometimes we do have email, sometimes we do it on the phone, but I try and get an idea of one, what the guy is looking for, what his expectations are. And a lot of guys are like, Hey, I want to hunt Africa. I've heard it's really great over there, but I don't know anything about it. Uh, can you help me? And so we'll get an idea of what it is that they want. And a lot of guys, what I recommend, especially for that first hunt, like let's go over for a week, maybe 10 days, something like that. And we'll just do a pretty, um, standard planes game hunt. So plane, so you divide game over there into two broad categories, dangerous game, right? Elephant, lion, crocodile, stuff like that. Uh, and then planes game is basically everything else, all your antelope and, and, and things of that nature. And so planes game is surprisingly affordable to hunt. A lot of people have an idea that Africa is very expensive to hunt. And I'm not going to say it's cheap to hunt over there, but these stories you hear of guys going spending, 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars or more that's on a really long dangerous game hunt usually that they're going over for uh you're going over there for a week or so for planes game you can shoot three four animals uh over there including your lodging all that stuff for i don't know five six thousand dollars depending on what you what you want to hunt you could do it for less than you would or about the same as a good guided elk hunt uh, somewhere one's not better than the other one but they're you know some, some people like one, some people like the other one, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, when when I, just to that point, I drew an alternate tag for elk in Montana. I guess it was two years ago now. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a week left of elk season. And their Department of Wildlife was like, hey, man, your name popped up. Can you come hunt an elk? And so I was kind of frantic, like looking around for guides and people that I knew and the mm -hmm. cheapest elk guides I could find were $6,000, and they had about a 30% success rate. So, yeah. And then it was on up from there, you know. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah, you go hunt on private land or, uh, or on an Indian reservation or something like that. You might have a much higher success rate, but you're going to pay a lot more for that hunt, too. Um, yeah. 
you will go to Africa. If you're hunting in a, in a place that's well managed and they're not over hunting it or any of that stuff, you go to a good place in Africa for plains game, you'll see more animals in a day than you will usually in an entire season of deer hunting in the United States. Not uncommon Ooh. to see 20, 30, 40, 50 Impala and then you know a smattering of, of, of the other stuff, right? Zebra, blue wildebeest, kudu, that sort of thing, right? Um, it's not always big bulls that you're seeing. So you're sometimes seeing young bulls and cows, and little ones and all that stuff, but there's just a lot going on over there. Game densities, for whatever reason, are just a lot higher over there. It's very interesting. And I've seen this in areas that are on private land, seen it on places that are just wild free roaming areas as well. And I think it has to do with the fact that uh, so many of these animals, they just eat different um, different types of food, right? It's not like a million deer all in the same area eating the same thing. You know, the kudu eat different things from the impala, and they all eat different things from the buffalo and and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so they're not they're not so much competing with each other for food. Some of them are browsers, some of them are grazers, some of them are both. Some of them browse up high, like a giraffe, right? A giraffe doesn't compete with anybody, right? Because he can reach up so high and get the stuff that no one else is going to eat, uh, that sort of thing. And so. You got you got a lot of different dynamics like that going on over there. And giraffe is another one of those darn species that uh, that you <laughs> you get to see over there too. That I have seen a, a few videos of people hunting giraffes. Yep, and some people do that, and um, some people it's a real big turnoff for them. And so you know, regardless, it's cool to see them though. And if nothing else, you could shoot them with your camera. Yeah, I did some of that last year. We were at the uh, that Ox Ranch place in Texas. Mm -hmm. And my wife was with me, and that that was the best part of the two days we were there was feeding the giraffes and petting the giraffes. Like that was just really cool. <laughs> when I was over there, we were hunting in some nasty, nasty thorn brush, thorns as high as my head, and messing around in there, we found this giant bone on the ground, and this bone was no kidding, like this long. And it was, we looked at it, we determined that it was a femur for a giraffe that had died there years before and like that was one heck of a dog bone that we found thing was like i said it was almost wow. as, uh, it was maybe about four feet long something like that right taller than my son is <laughs> man yeah so it's impressive seeing those animals i know you've seen them you know in person before but for someone that hadn't it's it's, it's something else and so w going back to kind of getting started with a lot of this stuff for someone that's never been there before and you just want to do that first time like i said planes game a week to 10 days something like that South Africa is a great place to go just to start to do that because one of the things people learn when they start looking into this for the first time is getting to Africa from the United States, kind of a pain in the rear. Um, there's, it's a really long flight to get there and then there's only a couple of direct flights to get there. You can fly from the United States from Atlanta or Newark, New Jersey direct into Johannesburg and that's it. Everywhere else you gotta go through the Middle East, gotta go through Europe, and everywhere else in Africa that you go to, if you don't go through Europe or the Middle East, you have to go through South Africa to get there. Uh, so mm. to get to Namibia or Zimbabwe or some, something like that, you go through Europe, the Middle East or South Africa uh, to get there. And so, you know, I was talking with one guy. He's like, yeah, you know, I live in Denver, you know, but I can't find any direct flights. And I was like, well, you know, I know Denver is a really big, big hub of an airport. and You could fly direct there to a lot of places, not to Africa. You got to you got to go through one of those other places first. And so um you know that's that's kind of a big deal uh w with that and that's another kind of a feature of of south africa it's just a lot easier and faster and cheaper to get there than it is to other places and then sometimes uh people you know what they have a good time on that first hunt they want to come back for buffalo um and then maybe do some a little bit more planes game hunting sometimes sometimes they go back to south africa sometimes they want to go somewhere else in africa depending on how they feel and, and that sort of thing but it's one of those things that's very intimidating the first time that you do it and then after that, like you, you get a lot more comfortable with it. And it's, it just becomes like just a regular travel. Still a lot that goes into it, but it's not nearly as nerve wracking as it is on that first trip or any of that stuff. So another question about Africa just popped up before we go on to anything else. Taxidermy. So mm -hmm. what if you want to bring it, bring it back? How does mm -hmm. that work? How do, so you could never do that. You could do it. You could do it two ways. One, you can take it to a, a taxidermist in Africa, right? Almost any place that has a big hunting culture over there, South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, whatever, they have taxidermists that are in those countries. 
Um, or you can, so that's, that's what's get, getting your stuff called getting your stuff finished in Africa. You send to a taxidermist there, ship it back to the United States, and you can put it straight on your wall. Failing that, if you don't want to do that, you can get it what's called dipped and shipped back. It's in some countries, they call it different things. In uh, New Zealand, they call it expediting. But basically what it is, they're putting, they're cleaning and treating this stuff to the minimum degree possible to reduce the odds that you're not going to be bringing back any weird bugs or diseases or anything. Yeah. And that preserves it for a little bit, but it's not like tanning the hide or doing actual taxidermy on it. Then you send it from that country to a taxidermist in your home country. They finish it. And then it gets sent back to your house. Um, it's one of these things that, you know, there's pros and cons of doing it either way. I've done it both ways myself. If you get it finished in Africa and shipped back, finished, your shipping is more expensive, but your taxidermy is less expensive. And then it's it's the flip side, right? It, it just takes up a lot more space to ship a kudu shoulder mount, right? In my old house, I had a kudu yeah. on, the, on the wall behind me uh, that, you, that you can see, but I don't, I don't have it here, but it's big, right? I mean, it's like, um, it's not exactly the same size of an elk. They're similar in body size, but their, their horns go straight up and in curls instead of yeah. you know, out to the sides and back like an elk. So they don't take up quite as much space as a big elk does, but they take up a lot of space. And so it's expensive to ship that back as opposed to just skulls and flat skins and things of that nature. Um, and so it's, you know, it's one of these things it's, it's extra cost that's on you added onto the hunt that you definitely want to look into and, and, and budget yeah. for it and plan for it before you commit to a bunch of stuff. Um, and it's also one of these things that just takes a while too. uh, things got just crazy messed up during COVID with the, you know, so when they ship stuff back from Africa, quite often these trophies will go as cargo on passenger airplanes. So the airlines are taking people back and forth in the hold, they'll have, along with all the bags, they'll have a bunch of freight and many of that stuff, a lot of that stuff is trophies. Well, when they shut down a lot of that stuff for COVID, uh, they stopped shipping that stuff back there. And then the taxidermists were non-essential workers for a period of time. And so there was a gigantic delay there. There were some people that hunted in 2019 that didn't get their stuff back until 2021 or 2022. And it's finally worked its way through the system with a lot of, with a lot of that now, but you're still looking at say six months at a minimum, more likely at least a year uh, to get your stuff back after, after your hunt and, you know, potentially longer, depending, depending on how you do it. Now, on one hand, it's kind of a bummer because it's uh, you're like, Hey, you know, I want my stuff back. You know, it was a great hunt. I want to hang at my house. And on the other side though, if like longer it takes, it gives you a little bit more time to spread the cost of the whole thing out instead of just paying for it all. And, uh, in one yeah. swoop too. and I don't know about where you're at in Texas, but, most of the taxidermists around me, they're not getting you a whitetail back within 12 months. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I just got some deer back uh, and it was 11 months and I was surprised that it was done already. Like I shot a hog here pretty recently and it was, it was a good size hog and I wanted to get the skull done on it. Just the skull just to have it set on my table. And I took a taxidermist. He's like, listen, don't even call me for nine months. Like it might be done then. Uh, but more more than likely longer than that. Like, I, fair enough, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, taxidermy, getting taxidermy done right, like, usually it takes a while. Uh, to, to do. And I, I had this conversation with my son. It was either today or yesterday. And we've got, I don't know, in the house, we got quite a bit of mounts. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're just looking at two whitetail, and it's a huge difference on this looks like a real deer and this looks like somebody did it in their basement who was trying to learn on YouTube videos on how to mount a deer. <laughs> it's not the same. And the, the one that's cool. Go ahead. Have you got your stuff back from Colorado yet? No, I haven't. Um, I hadn't even thought about it in a while since you just said that. Uh, but yeah, I got a shoulder mount of my mm -hmm. pronghorn and the buffalo. Well, you'll see, I have a, Right. I got mine right behind me. Right. Here's my right. There's the bison. And then I got the pronghorn right there. But they're both both skull mounts. And so I got them back within, I say, four or five months, uh, some, something like that. It would would nearly as long as it would take for a for a shoulder mount like that. They did a pretty good job with it. I was I was I was happy overall with with the quality of work. So I hope your shoulder mounts look good, too. And the guy called me. I mean, it's been a while, but just to go mm -hmm. over the what do you want done and, you know, looking left or straight and all that stuff. Uh, 
But yeah, I haven't heard from him in a while. I yeah, forgot all yeah. about it. We're coming up on a year, so I mean, it's not even get you know we're getting into the typical amount of time that they would be done. You know, you've, it, even if he's not slow and running behind. And I want to say that was the guy that something about when he gets them all done, he travels the country with a trailer and delivers them. I think that's what he told me. Does that uh, maybe up? I don't know. He shipped my stuff to me just via FedEx, uh, but maybe that was just because mine was skull bounce. It's a lot easier to ship those. Yeah, I think that was part of like keeping the cost down. He was saying that mm -hmm. he waits until he has like a whole trailer full and then takes a week or two and just drives the U.S. and here you go, here you go, here you go kind of thing. I think so that's when, the one. So when I lived in El Paso, I had a gigantic, I had an office that was a lot bigger than this. And just the way the walls and everything were set up in there, it was very conducive to putting a lot of taxidermy in there. So I had all my taxidermy in this office. It was really impressive. And uh, when it was time for us to move out here to Lufkin, I was like, all right, I need to get, I need to do this right. I want to get all this taxidermy torn up. And so I contracted with a guy that was a trophy shipper. That was exactly what he would do. But that was, that was his only job was he drove a truck. He had like a F-350 Super Duty or something like that with a, like a 20 foot long trailer that was just packed full of people's taxidermy and you'd wrap your stuff up real nice and label it and mount it to the wall in there and all that. And I looked in it when he picked up my stuff at my house, it was just a crazy bunch of stuff, animals you wouldn't even have thought of existed in there. And then when I looked in it again, a week later, when he dropped it off at my new place, it's all in a storage unit now because I don't have room for it here. Uh, but it was all different stuff that he had in there too, man. It just all turned over in the course of a week. Uh, so man, just, he had this gigantic sw swan in there that a guy had shot, you know, a, a cool. Watusi, uh, that a guy had shot somewhere, uh, just all kinds of weird stuff. In addition to all the normal deer and elk and African stuff and, and all that. So like, there's definitely places that, that do exactly what you're talking about. Somehow this guy was able to make a living by doing just that. And it looked like he was making a good living too, man. Yeah, I could do that. I mean, if you know enough people, I can 100% see the the need for mm -hmm. it. And real quick, I saw it pop up. A big thanks to Mark KDX Ryder for the super chat. Always appreciate you watching. Appreciate you hanging out with me and John in the chat tonight. That's a good super Look, chat. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate everybody big time. On the uh uh what was I just gonna say? Oh, it was on the tip of my tongue. Oh, you said swans. That made mm -hmm. me think of something. So I was mule deer hunting in Montana last year. This is October, November. There was snow on the ground. It was pretty cold, a lot colder than I'm used to. And uh, all of a sudden I hear something, a sound that I've never heard before in my life. And I'm looking and I'm not seeing something. And my buddy, Chad, uh, Chad Shear, you know, Chad Shear. I've heard his name. Yeah. Uh, he said, that's swans. Look, and they were up pretty high, like, High enough to where it didn't easily catch my eye scanning the sky. He said, that's swans. Then when I went to his place, he had one mounted, like up in the <laughs> ceiling. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing that you can hunt swans. Like, I'm thinking of the all those pretty birds in the movies or whatever. Like, no, mm -hmm. up here, we shoot them. A for that. I'm like, ah, that's another thing that I need to get on my list to mount for my house. There you go, man. Yeah. Have, have you ever hunted a sandhill crane before? No, but I've seen them. You said Abilene. I was hunting in Abilene last whitetail season in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. at, I think Guitar Ranch is that that's where I was. Okay, I think, I think you uh, told me about this hunt. Yeah, and just driving, they were everywhere that week mm -hmm. that I happened to be deer hunting. It seemed like every farm there was just hundreds in the fields, like. What is happening right now? And the same thing. Oh, we hunt those. Like, oh, I never yeah. seen one of those before, you know? Yeah, they winter down in the Abilene, Lubbock area and whatnot and get fat during the winter on those, uh, all those agricultural fields down there. Let's make a point of sometime in the future, you know, in the winter sometime. I got a good outfitter that has great sandhill crane hunting. That's a lot of fun. And they, 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 they do, I wouldn't say they taste literally like ribeye, like it, it's a, it's a, it's a good play on words, calling them ribeye of the sky, but you know, I've heard them described as maybe sirloin or something. But regardless, they taste fantastic, and they're a lot of fun to hunt too. So, how do you hunt those? Like you hunt them like ducks or geese. You hunt them out in the field with 
with decoys and then an a frame blind, uh, that sort of thing. Just that 12 gauge. Mm -hmm. You got to yep. use non lead for them. You know, believe it or not, they are not considered in, in the state of Texas anyway. I can't speak to any other place. They're not considered the sort of waterfowl that you are required to use lead free shot on. Um, sometimes you'll have ducks or geese come in with them. And so for that reason, most people, when they hunt them, they'll hunt with non-toxic shot. Uh, so they could you know, shoot one of those that uh, the other comes in. But I think if you wanted to be, there was a guy that I was hunting with that actually called the game warden. It was like, listen, like, tell me straight, what do I need to do here? Yeah. Can I get, can I get away with, uh, 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 you know, lead shot? And he's like, oh yeah, as long as you're not shooting anything else, like you can use them on, on Sand Hill Crane. And so I didn't, I've always been a deer hunter, primarily whitetail. I've only shot two mule deer in my life. I didn't know anything about waterfowl hunting. So two years ago was the first time I ever went duck hunting. And my buddy's like, you got your shells? And I was like, man, I got tons of 12 gauge shells. What are you talking about? <laughs> and he's like, no, you can't just use any shells. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like I had even gone to the store and got some like hopped up ones. And hopped he's up like, lead shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like, you can't shoot ducks with that. And I thought he was pulling my leg. Like, I've never hunted ducks or geese. And he's like, seriously, look it up. You can't use lead on this stuff, man. I'm not kidding. Like, oh. That's a big no-no doing that, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I learned, but I'd never been before, so I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's a, it's a fun deal. I'm not really a big waterfowl hunter uh, either. I'll hunt birds just on occasion or anything, but I know a guy that, that did it, and I went out there just kind of on a lark and had a fantastic time with him. I had so much time, like I said, that's why I did that podcast hunt uh, again with the same guy this past year. It was, yeah. it was a lot of fun doing it. And I actually took my dad for his birthday this last January to Bill Byers Hunt Club. Look it up sometime. I told my dad, you're not going to believe this, but this is like right in the perfect spot of Arkansas. You're going to see more geese and duck than you've ever seen in your life. And we did. I've got some video footage of it, our trip. I mean – thousands of ducks in the sky Jeez. and my dad he had a blast he i wanted to shoot a goose and i ended up only shooting ducks he only and he shot like five geese uh speckled belly geese if you know what that is mm -hmm. but we had a blast i mean the whole time it's just there's a duck there's a goose there's you know hunting out of pit blinds you know sunk down in the dirt and I what kind it. of what kind of ducks were there there was a lot of mallards uh mallards um pintails i'm not an expert uh mm -hmm. green wing teals uh blue wing teals um there was one that's like a like a spoon nose type thing with a blue beak i forget what that's called mm -hmm. spoon bill or i don't know mm -hmm. um and then we shot speckle belly geese and there was a bunch of snow geese, which is one I wanted to mount. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up mounting the biggest goose, that speckle belly goose that my dad shot. Uh, we didn't shoot any snows, but we saw a bunch of them. And then my dad shot a Ross's goose, which I thought was just like a baby uh, snow goose when we picked it up. But our guide was like, no, that's a Ross's goose. That's kind of cool that you shot one. That's more rare. But I don't know. Then hey, looking Adam, back, I wish I had mounted it. I got to go check something real quick. I'll yeah, be right back. Give me one second. <clears throat> Let me run to the chat here. John is a good dude. Like I said, uh, make sure you're following him. Follow him on his podcast. His podcast is everywhere you listen to podcasts. He's got his YouTube channel, which, again, is a bunch of free information. Uh, and then I'm subscribed to his newsletter. He's always putting out. Uh, stuff on that newsletter with a bunch of good information. Oh, this is a good question. Let me know if you have any commentary on this, and then I'll put in my two cents. Do you have any experience with these two, CZ600 Alpha or CVA Cascade? I'm familiar with the CVA Cascade, but not the CZ600. So I've got both of them. I actually have uh, several videos on the CZ600 and 65 PRC. Phenomenal rifle. Uh, right out of the box, I was just about putting them in the same hole with a couple different factory loadings. CVA Cascade, I've got several of those, and 
they're kind of in the same ballpark. Really, my answer would probably be uh, whichever one you can find. Both of those are kind of hard to find in, in some cartridges uh, or some loadings. Uh, but you probably can't go wrong with either of them. Good triggers, adjustable triggers, uh, above par stocks, um, heavier barrels than the average rifle, um, and not very expensive. I actually just saw a bunch of deals on the 600 Alphas for 400 bucks. Man. That's, that's cheaper than a Savage Axis or a Ruger American. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would say you couldn't go wrong with either one of those. And I typically lean towards the budget friendly stuff. Uh, CVA Cascade is a little bit less budget friendly than some other things, but I like them both. I've had got yeah, both. Of them. Let me check in on my notes here real quick. So something else I got sit, written down to ask you about. Have you ever hunted with 350 Legend? No, I never have, believe it or not. It's one of these things. Everyone I've ever talked to that's done it has nothing but awesome things to say about it on things like deer and hogs. So, yes, similar conversations I have. So, I I read every single comment on every platform every day, and I respond to everybody. Everybody that I talk to that hunts with 350 Legend loves it. Ah, oh, I'm taking 50 deer with my 350 Legend, or my kids hunt with 350 Legend. I've shot two deer with 350 Legend, and those are the only two deer I ever remember not finding oh my goodness we shot my son shot them both last year one was in the heart one was in the head the one he shot in the heart it ran laid down about 50 yards away and then got up and we never found it it had to have run at least a mile just based on Man. the grid that we did and this is a doe you know mm -hmm. a small doe right through the heart it had to have died where it laid down 50 yards away, there was a pool of blood that big. I bet the thing died. He hit it right in the heart. I filmed it. I saw the footage. So that same day in the afternoon, I said, look, we're hunting in the woods. The furthest shot is 30 yards. And he's a good shot. I sighted that rifle in for 25 yards because that's the furthest we're going to shoot. And I said, next deer you see, we're going to shoot it in the head because I, I'm not doing that to another deer with this. Uh, and one of my goals is to film a deer hunt with every cartridge. So mm -hmm. basically, if you type in 350 Legend vs. Deer, you're going to find my videos kind of thing, you know. Uh, he shot it in the head. I've got video footage of it. I didn't post the video footage of either one of these deer hunts, but I still have the footage on my computer. Uh, instant fall over. Exactly what you would expect. That deer was lights out. We're sitting there for a minute high-fiving. Get down. The thing's right in front of us at 20 yards. Like, instant lights out. That deer stood up, took off, never saw it again. I'd never seen anything like it. Like, it shocked the, the nervous system, and it was out. It didn't even twitch. Instant out. And then the thing stood up and ran away. So, from my perspective, I don't like 350 Legend. I think it's mm -hmm. underpowered, and you should hunt with something else. But everyone I talk to loves 350 legend i mean like you see the stuff on tv like the people sponsored by winchester and all that they're praising it of course and they're shooting these like 300 pound deer with it and i'm like well the 50 pound whitetail that my son shot kind of sniffed its nose at 350 legend but that's just my experience with it it's one of those interesting things just about hunting and ballistics and whatnot you know if you're shooting 10 deer a year, you're in the top 1% of all deer hunters that, you know, most, most people, if they're lucky are shooting one deer. And so, you know, a lot of guys may shoot 10 deer in their lives, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you're dealing with a small sample size and weird things can happen sometimes. Right. You know, so, and especially when you don't recover the deer, it's really hard to determine exactly what the heck went wrong, uh, too, yep. uh, with it. You know, some deer are just tougher than other deers and you know there's some deer maybe with the same shot placement will run 10 yards and die others will, will run a mile um sometimes just weird things happen too where there's a lot of places you can hit a deer in the head and knock it unconscious but not necessarily kill it there yeah. was a, a story that kevin robertson told me he was a professional hunter for a long time in in uh, zimbabwe and he was 
guiding a guy on a Cape Buffalo hunt. And they were in an area where they were on the tracks of a buffalo. And he said that the uh, the ground there was so soft, it was like walking on carpet. So they're able to walk very, very uh, quietly. And he said, but it was like walking down a tunnel that these elephants had made through the grass and whatnot. It was like a wall oh, wow. of grass on each side, but you could just like slip down almost silently through it. And they knew they were on the tracks of this buffalo. And he says, told the guys like, listen, we're catching up to this buffalo and he's going to sense that we're here sooner or later. And when we have a close encounter with him, he's going to turn around and he's going to be 10 yards in front of you. And you just need, he's going to look at you like this. And he said, just shoot him in the nose. When you do that, Ooh. it'll drop. He said, okay, no problem. And sure enough, as predicted, come around the corner and the Buffalo is just standing there looking at him eight yards away, shoot it in the nose. And when a Buffalo looks at you like that, when they have their head up like that, if you shoot them through the nose, it'll go through the head into the brain and, and kill them. He placed the shot perfectly. The Buffalo dropped. Uh, but in this case, they uh, did what you're supposed to do when you have an animal, uh, especially like a buffalo, that drops like that. They ran up to it and they shot it again on the ground. And they said when they got up to it, it was kind of kicking and trying to get up. And his eyes were rolling back in his head. He said it was a weird, weird deal. It looked like a, a boxer that had just gotten the, the heck knocked out of him. And he was more unconscious than anything yeah. else. But they shot him down through the spine into the shoulders and killed it. And uh, they were having a good old time party in that night. He was celebrating this Buffalo and the tracker walked up to him and he handed him this bullet that they'd recovered from the Buffalo and said, well, I thought you want to see this. He shot this Buffalo with a 375 in the nose and the tracker found the bullet on the tongue of the Buffalo went into the nose, deflected down. Wow. And that was it. And so it knocked him, just knocked so it. Heck shocked out. it. So yeah. that's prob that's probably mm -hmm. something literally what mm -hmm. happened to us on that deer. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Literally. Yeah. You, know, you shoot it, you know, down through the jaw or, or something like that, or maybe hit you know, on the top of the skull and maybe it kind of hit it and transferred a lot of energy and knocked it unconscious, but maybe it kind of deflected out without, you know, getting into the, uh, into the skull uh, and, you know, directly affecting the brain like that. Maybe one of these things where it gave the deer such a terrible concussion, give a TBI and it dies, you know, on down the line i don't know or maybe it was just fine who knows it's hard to say when you don't recover it but you know things like that you know they happen sometimes and like i said if you don't recover the animal would you, you would just never know yeah and i absolutely hate talking about it but i mean that's real life and things happen sometimes mm -hmm. uh, yeah i've been there too you know so give us a quick spiel you took the hog with the 458 wind mag Give us a mm -hmm. give us a rundown off the cuff of 458 wind mag. All right. So I was just talking about a 375 H and H. Really long British cartridge designed 1912 for use on specifically dangerous games. So it was made back in the day when they were making the switch from black powder over to smokeless powder. And so with smokeless powder, you could shoot bullets a lot faster than you can with black powder. Uh, with black powder, if you're doing 2,000 feet per second, that is super duper fast. And so what they were doing back then was since you couldn't shoot these bullets very fast, no matter how much black powder you put behind it, you, they would use gigantic bullets, very uh, large bore, very, very heavy stuff. But since they could shoot stuff faster with smokeless powder, you could push at 2,500 feet per second or 2,700 or 3,000 feet per second or something. So you allow you to use a much uh, smaller diameter bullet 375 is still really big but it's smaller than, than the than the various 400s 500s 600s that they were using back then 500 jeffrey that i know that you have um yep but uh this is a case where it's a very long case shooting a three three seven five caliber bullet right so 30-06 is 308 this is 375 300 grain bullet at about 2,500 feet per second, something like that. You're getting 4,000, 4,500 foot pounds of energy. So it's a lot, Ooh. right? It's, you know, um, and so it is considered, say, the minimum for hunting dangerous game in Africa. Cape Buffalo, that's where they probably more Cape Buffalo have been killed with 375 than anything else. Great cartridge for that. It's a great all around cartridge, too, uh, because it still shoots reasonably flat. It hits really hard, but it doesn't just kill you with recoil either. It recoils more than a lot of other stuff, but it's not terrible. So that was the gold standard for a long time. And so a lot of rifles were built um, to the specifications of the 375 H&H Magnum. 
Well, after World War II, a lot of Americans started wanting to go hunt in Africa. And they wanted to use an American rifle with an American cartridge that also wasn't as expensive as a rifle in 375 H&H, right? You know, in the 1950s, it was a pain in the rear to get a get a bolt action 375 from Europe or something sure. like that. And so um, Winchester came up with the idea, let's take the Winchester Model 70, 30 on six length action, and let's come up with a dangerous game cartridge that's going to fit in it. So I took that 375 H&H case, necked it up to 45 caliber, so 458 caliber, and shortened it a little bit. And so it'll fit in that same linked action as the 30 out 6 with the Magnum bolt face. And so uh, it they had a lot of teething problems with it at first. It was They were trying to get a little bit more performance than they could really get with the powders they had at the time. But 60, 70 years down the line, we have much better powders now. We're able to get the performance uh, that they originally wanted and needed out of that cartridge with what we got in that standard linked action. And so as a fantastic big bore cartridge, for hunting big game like that, really big dangerous game like Buffalo or something like that. A lot of guys, you say, in Africa that are guides, professional hunters guiding dangerous game hunts will use a 458 Win Mag or a 458 Lot, which is similar but longer, as a backup gun, right? Guy wounds the Cape Buffalo and they shoot it with that to keep it from killing anyone or anything. So it's a big, big bore stopper cartridge. And it is uh, a 458 typically a bolt action or? Yes. Yes, you almost always it is right. Uh, every now and then you'll find one that's in a, a single shot or something, and there's um, very similar, um, but not exactly the same cartridges that you can use in a double rifle, that sort of thing. But so, like the Winchester Model Seventy was like the rifle for the four five eight Win Mag for a long time. They've made it in other rifles, the CZ five fifty, the Ruger M seven seven, all that. Well. Like I said, one of the big things with it is you need a standard linked action, not a full magnum linked action. And if you actually look around, it's especially today, it is kind of a pain in the rear to find a rifle with a magnum linked action. They're expensive, they're hard to get, that sort of thing. Because there's just not a lot of need for stuff like that. But yep. you could take a rifle in say 300 Win Mag and then rechamber it to 458 Win Mag, and that will work. Well, so my hmm. dad, my dad and I are both left-handed, and there's not a lot of dangerous game rifles to begin with, and there's even fewer that are left-handed. Ruger does make some, though. Uh, they're, uh, they make their Hawkeye rifle in a, in a left-handed action. So my dad came up with the idea, what if I get one of these Ruger Hawkeyes that's left-handed, 300 Win Mag, rechamber it to 458 Win Mag? And it literally is as simple as putting, chain, taking the 30 caliber barrel off, putting a 45 caliber barrel on it, and then just head spacing it appropriately. Use the same bolt face, all that stuff on it, right? Wow. And so that's what he did. And he was telling me, John, it shoots great, but this thing just kicks like nobody's business. It shoots a 500 grain bullet at 2,100 feet per second. And this is an eight pound rifle. And if you were to go out and buy a Winchester Model 70 in 458 Win Mag, it would probably weigh about 10 pounds. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be quite a bit heavier. But in any case, um, I was thinking to myself, the old man's getting soft. He doesn't deal with recoil like he used to. I'll show you how it's done, Dad. And so he gave me this rifle. I started shooting it. And I, was, I, was, I wasn't too proud to admit that he wasn't exaggerating. That thing just kicked like nobody's business. It was almost too painful to shoot accurately. I was developing a flinch and all this stuff. And I was looking at it. I was like, man, I got to do something about it. This is a great gun. It shoots accurately, but I just, I just can't deal with it. It's just too much. I was looking into ways to make it heavier, put some, re, you know, some mercury, mercury recoil reducers in the stock or something like that to tame it a little bit. Cause like I said, it shot great. It was a wonderful, easy to carry cartridge. But then I got to thinking this was right around the time that silencer central introduced the banish 46. I was like, man, what mm. if I got one of those silencers and put it on here, thread this barrel, put a silencer on it, use it like that. And Oh my God, that silencer made it so much easier to shoot. It made it heavier. But it took it down to about 375 H&H levels of recoil in an eight-pound rifle. It was heavier than that with the suppressor, but still, like, a lot easier to carry. And you're still getting 458 power, but just with recoil that was a whole lot less. And it went from just being terrible to shoot to being stout, but a whole lot more manageable. And so um, I thought, man, this is really cool. I live in East Texas. I've got a lot of hogs that are around here. And I will commonly get a hog that kind of hits a feeder at the same time every day. And I'll try and pattern them and go out there and kill it. And I thought, man, well, how cool would it be to go out and shoot a really big hog with this 458? 
Um, I wanted to take it to Africa and shoot a buffalo with it, and things just didn't quite work out on that part of the hunt. But I got an opportunity here recently. This hog kept coming in, same time every day. You could almost set your watch by him. But he would come in early in the morning, um, but leave before the sun came up. So there wasn't really mm-hmm. legal legal shooting light isn't really a thing you can hunt um hogs at night here but you need an artificial light or something like that or a thermal right you was leaving before it was light enough for me to shoot him with a regular scope so i took a thermal scope and i mounted it on my ruger and uh i went out there and i ambushed him one morning and uh, i got a great video of shooting this hog but he was he was a good size hog got a great video of him walking by and he kind of turns and starts eating. And I shoot him with this four five, eight. It looked like a truck hit him and he just went boom, just, just over like that. And, and that was it. And, um, the video is not up on YouTube yet. It's coming up in a couple of days. I'll, I'll put it up, but it was amazing. If you, you watching the video in the scope, how little the crosshairs jump, it goes up like that and then back down. And that was it. It wasn't just you know way up. Like you would expect, you know, something like that. And, I was able to to get on him again in case I would have needed to shoot him again or if there was another one uh, with him or anything. So that was a really cool experience, shooting with a 458 uh, just like that. One, to just a proof, proof of concept that you could do it. And then just also, also just to demonstrate just how good that Banish 46 is at reducing recoil, too. They don't advertise it as being good uh, with the 458 Win Mag. And I, honestly, I think it's just because a lot of people are interested in doing that. More of a 450 Bushmaster suppressor or something like that a lot more people are gonna be doing that um i don't know if it's hearing safe with it but man it's it is definitely quieter and it definitely recoils a whole lot less uh with it than without it absolutely so i was just gonna say i filmed a video last week with the same suppressor i've got the bandage 46 on my 450 bushmaster there you go man yeah on, on 450 Bushmaster, I mean, it recalls like a 243 or something. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, 450 isn't incredibly hard of a recalling rifle. I mean, it is bigger than more than some others, but mm-hmm. with that can on there, it's literally, I'd let my wife shoot it, no problem. Probably even yes. my kids. But yeah, I have a friend whose wife has a, she has an AR and 450 Bushmaster. They were from Iowa, so they had to hunt with straight wall cartridges and whatnot. And she just got like that gun. They put the Banish 46 on it. And she was like, she's like, you know, she could deal with it without it. But she's like, man, it's just a lot easier <laughs> with it. Yep. And, you know, 450 Bushmaster isn't a 458 Win Mag, but like it's, I mean, it's still, it's still a thumper on both ends, man. Yep. And I've shot, I've put that same can on my 338 Win Mag and same thing. It takes a bunch out of it. That recalls more than the 450 Bushmaster. I'm pretty confident in it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and so I've the, shot a hog with that one. There you go, man. Yeah. And so the 338 Win Mag, same idea as the 458 Win Mag. 375 H and H neck down to 338 instead of necked up to 458 and then just shortened like that. So Winchester designed the 264 Win Mag, the 338 Win Mag, the 458 Win Mag, and the 300 Win Mag all within the space of a couple of years there using the same principles. You take that 375, neck it up or down to the right caliber, shorten it a little bit, put it in the Model 70, and you're good to go. See, this guy knows all this stuff off the top of his head, and I absolutely love it. I love going down rabbit holes and nerding out on this stuff. I actually just got recently a new 338 Win Mag. I got two of them now. My guy at my FFL texted me. He said, man, I got a gun I know you're going to buy. People trade him in stuff all the time, and he'll text me if it's something cool, you know, before they put it on the shelf. And I'm like, really? What is it? And he said, it's a Ruger American in 338 Wind Mag. Oh, it's, man. It's, it's called the Alaskan, and mm-hmm. apparently they only made like 500 of them. It's got a stainless steel barrel, and it's threaded in 338 Wind Mag. And the thing shoots. And I don't know why it ended up in Tennessee. I think mm-hmm. a lot of them went to Alaska. It's called the Alaskan. We don't really need 338 wind mags in Tennessee. Maybe uh, some guy bought did. it one to go hunt bear in Alaska with it or something. Who knows? Maybe. And he yeah. had a a, a a scope on it that I probably wouldn't have put on a 338 wind mag. So it was kind of a, a I'd say, chintzy scope with low power. Uh which I don't know, like may, it would make sense for deer hunting in Tennessee, I guess, mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. a scope. Uh, but 
I thought maybe it had been shot out. It's going to be a piece of junk. They gave me a pretty good deal on it, so I wasn't too terribly worried. But the thing shoots. shoots there you good. go, man. Yeah. Yeah, so the 338 is just a great medium bore round like that. It's not really big enough to hunt Cape Buffalo or something with, but you can hunt darn near everything else with it. The big bears, moose, elk, all that stuff. We actually have a 338 Win Mag as a client rifle in Africa. It's fantastic on planes game. I have a suppressor on it so it doesn't recoil a lot. And yeah. um, you know, it just gives you a little bit more margin for error, whatnot, shooting those big animals when the shot angles aren't always perfect. And, all that stuff. And it's one of those things guys come over. Um, they've never shot one of those before. And then they fall in love with it by the end of the hunt. Yeah. And I've, I've shot two things with the 338. I love talking about this. I want to, I want my goal is to shoot whitetail with everything and film it, but at a, I'll never film everything. Cause we don't, I'd have to shoot 50 deer a year, yeah. but uh, the 338, I shot the hog. That was at a hundred yards. I was in Texas lights out. That video was up, and then I shot a, uh, I don't even know the right pronunciation, Sika or Sika, S-I-K-A. Yeah, so I was talking with my guy on my most recent hunt, and he said either is appropriate. He was calling him Sika deer. I call him Sika deer, but I know what you're talking about. I call him Sika, too. They're, I think yeah. they're from Japan. Anyways, it was on that same hunt where I hunted three days and couldn't find an axis deer. Mm -hmm. It was my last night. And it's dark and the guy's, you know, coming to pick us up. And he says, man, it's Texas, right? There's a lot less restrictions, especially when it's exotic stuff. You can pretty much do whatever you want. He said, I got this big old psycho deer in the middle of this field. I just saw him on the way to pick you up. Do you want to shoot him? Like, we'll turn the spotlights on and you can just blast him. And I was like, you know what? I'm going home tomorrow. Let's do it. So we flew over there in the side by side. I jumped out. We flipped the headlights on and. You know, 60 yards in the dark, I shot this psycho deer with 338 wind man. <laughs> and that one's on my wall right now. Oh, so yeah, there mounted, you go, man. Mounted it. Not not ideal how I wanted that hunt to go, but if I'm not, I don't want to go empty handed driving. We drove all the way to West Texas, Uvalde. I said, I'm going to go home with something and shot that psycho deer. But Jeez, man. Well, it ended up working out. Yeah, I'm glad you got something out of it. Uh, but so it sounds like you got a lot of use out of that 338, uh, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I might try to shoot a whitetail with it this year. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I consider trying to shoot a deer with my 458, but getting the hog was a good, uh, good thing to do here in the meantime. That's a nice thing, right? You could, one of them pops up in August or something like that when hunting seasons for darn near everything are closed. It's a nice, uh, nice change of pace. <laughs> it, I need to find a reason to go to Texas. I don't have anything booked. I'm trying to think this deer season at all. Where last year I was in Texas like three or four times, but uh, I'll find a reason to be over there and and we'll hang out if I'm coming through there. I I went. I think I drove through Lufkin twice last year. Yeah, I think you told me you got your taxidermy done here or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, over in uh, Huntington. Huntington. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I picked up four animals there. Like, I don't know when it was several months ago. But yeah, well, yeah, definitely. We'll meet up with you next time you come through. Uh, not a lot of people make it uh, make it out to this part of the state. <laughs> yeah, and how I found Huntington, there's a breeder there who does red stag and black bucks and uh, axis deer. And uh, I looked up what's the cheapest place I can go shoot an axis deer, and it was this guy's place. And I said, oh, I'm going to bring my kids and let's shoot one of everything. Mm -hmm. so that's what we did. Red stag, mm -hmm. black buck, uh, fallow, and something else. We shot so much I forget. Well, but you're yeah. definitely way ahead of me in the uh, the exotic game. I don't have any of that stuff. Uh, and, and my uh, my career hunting them is not off to an auspicious start with that uh, most recent hunt. <laughs> There's plenty of them out there. That's right. Just got to give it another go and hopefully it'll work out better the next time. And at, on that trip going to Uvalde, the West Texas, whatever highway we were on, I actually saw a bunch of wild axis deer, like just on the side of the road as we're driving, like, oh my, like that's a big one. Just randomly wild axis deer everywhere over there. We almost hit two real nice bucks on separate nights with our truck as we were driving home from the hunting area. They're running across the road, man. 
Yep. That's how it works. <laughs> Which in, te in Texas, you could technically shoot an axis deer at night if you wanted to, couldn't you? I'm pretty sure that's legal. You, you can hunt them at night, yeah. You you couldn't do it like uh, in, in this case from a public road on uh, someone else's property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not driving. No, you can't do that. But but yeah, like I know some people will spotlight them and and that sort of thing, you know. And like just like you said with the with the sick of deer, or that's that's legal. You could do that. You know, they're not game animals. There's no closed season on them. There's no bag limit. There's no uh, legal shooting hours. Same thing with hogs too, right? You know, so some people do it. And some people uh, some people don't. So to each his own. And I'm 100% not an expert on this, but axis deer actually get hard horned at different times of the year so you can yeah. have some hard horned axis as you're hunting whitetail in the winter but then there some you can shoot in the spring so yeah. that's kind of a cool thing about axis deer is you can hunt them longer than just deer season yeah that is a weird fact that i recently learned about them too i thought that was pretty cool and i only found that out from talking to this guy because he's like he's going through it you know well, do you want to shoot a velvet one? Do you want a hard horn one? Because that depends on what to, what month I'm going to tell you to come up here. Uh, but yeah, I didn't know that either. Mm -hmm. I ended up shooting a hard horn one. I didn't want to fool with a velvet. But yeah. But yeah. Well, we got any more uh, good questions coming through in the comments, or you have any more in your notes you wanted to bring up? Oh, we got to we got to run through the comments. I appreciate everybody hanging out. What's up to Timothy? Hey, man, I ain't seen you in a while. You need to run by and say, hey. Uh, what else are you guys talking about? Uh, speaking of, you mentioned the 500, Jeffrey. Literally, we were at church tonight, and I was talking to my dad about some hunting stuff, and he brought up the 500, Jeffrey. That is the only gun I own that I will not let anybody shoot. It is dangerous. Like, I'll have it at the range. People, you can come up to me. You want to shoot my 50 BMG? Have at it, man. Have a good time. You know, you don't come across people shooting that much. Mm -hmm. 500 Jeffrey? Nope. I won't let you shoot it. It's too dangerous. I would let you shoot it because, obviously, I know you've shot a lot bigger guns than I have and gone to Africa and all that. But my 500 Jeffrey? Oh, my. The, it has a metal trigger guard. It's a Sako... Uh, 85 XL is what it is. Metal trigger guard. I have not found a way to shoot it where I can have my finger in that trigger guard and the trigger guard not just about break my finger. Oh, my goodness. Jeez. Every every single time, it just about breaks my trigger finger. And not to mention, uh, if I shoot it three or four times, I'll have a golf ball welt to come out of my shoulder every time, no, no matter how I shoot it. Man. Uh, but, but it's got some power. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's fun to shoot at all. <laughs> no, no, I bought it. it. <laughs> no, I'll probably never get rid of that one. Uh, but yeah, if if I had a reason to, you know, use it, like if we were hunting elephants or something, that's that's literally what's printed on. I've got two boxes of factory ammo. One has a picture of an elephant. It's a Norma factory load. Then I have another Norma factory load that has a picture of a. a we're just talking about it. buffalo, yeah. Cape buffalo on it. So, but yeah, I have no reason to have a 500 Jeffrey other than make some YouTube videos on it. But I got it for like half off, so I bought it. Yeah, you're the only person I've ever known that's owned one of those rifles too. It's not a not a super popular thing either. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. I got no reason to have it. That's the. I think that's the that's the second most expensive gun I've ever bought in my life. But. And you got it half off yeah. too. Yeah, half off. Mm -hmm. like the said, guy, those, the, those big guns are expensive, man. <laughs> well, and I found a, a three seventy five H and H at my same local place here locally, but it's a real nice Browning and high gloss, and like they want some big money for it. The guy said, "Ah, you don't have one of those. You need to buy." I said, "Ah, it's too expensive for me, man." Mm -hmm. It was like a, a chinked up, used one that somebody could get me a deal on. I'd probably buy it, but. This thing was like I didn't I didn't even want to pick it up because it was so nice and shiny. I said I'm gonna scratch it and you'll make me buy it. You know, that is kind of the nice thing about some of that stuff though, is that there's a lot of guys that buy brand new rifles in a dangerous game caliber like 375, go on one hunt with it, and then you know they don't need it anymore and they sell it. 
Um, my 375 that I actually bought brought on my on, killed my bison with it. Wes killed his bison with it too. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that one was exactly what that was. A, a, an old man bought it, and um, he died. And I bought it at his estate sale. He was my neighbor, and, and I bought it as a estate sale. And it came with two boxes of ammo. One was full, and one had nine rounds missing from it. And I think what happened was he shot those nine rounds from it, and that was the only only rounds that had been put through that thing uh, when he had it because it was still just almost pristine shape. And I got it for you know half of MSRP on it. Yeah, so almost the same thing. What happened with mine was an old guy had a, a Africa trip planned, and then it got canceled for coronavirus stuff. Mm-hmm. So he sold it back to the shop. Then my buddy in Alabama, it was at his shop, and he said, I know a guy who will buy this off you. You're never going to sell it to anybody if you give him a good deal. And they sold it to me for half off just to get it off the shelves and not let it sit there for five years. Yeah, that's the thing with that stuff, man. (laughs) Yeah. And they were glad to get rid of it. Yeah. If anybody watching the show or listening to the podcast has a crazy weird thing in your shop, tell them you know a guy who will buy it if you get a really good deal on it, and they call me. There you go, man. That's how you get the giant collection of guns that you got, huh? Yeah, it's kind of a problem, but it's a business expense, man. That's that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, I know I, how you feel, man. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually, I was in Logan Sport. Do you know where that is? It's on the border of Texas and Louisiana. Okay, I do know that. Yeah, uh-huh. it's not far from you. I think it might be two hours from you. Yeah, I stopped in a little shop and bought a gun and a bunch of ammo, not even meaning to. That guy called me yesterday. He's like, hey, man, I got a deal You, I know you're not going to turn down. And it's like a real good deal. Um, and now I got to buy like four more guns. <laughs> but, but what I, I say buy, it's actually going to be free because what I'm doing is now that I got suppressors, I'm, I'm trading out stuff that's not threaded for stuff that is threaded. So, like, I need a threaded 270, a threaded 243. A thread at 308. So I'm I'm trading those off and then I'm getting things with threads on them. Yeah, that's that's the way I'm going. I've gotten a lot of my stuff threaded and I'm basically only buying new stuff that uh that's already threaded. Yeah, it's it's a hassle up front to get those cans, but once you get them, it's a game changer. Every time I'm at the range, people are what are you shooting? Uh, the 338 wind mag I was shooting, the guy didn't believe me that it was 338 wind mag. He said, that's so quiet. It's not recalled. I said, that's the suppressor, man. Mm-hmm. Suppressor. Yeah. But yeah, I absolutely love it. Uh, but hey, we've been on here for over an hour. I appreciate everybody for hanging out. Definitely go check out my friend John, his YouTube channels down below. Everybody subscribe. Everybody go check out his podcast. You've seen just a small sample of his knowledge here in this video, us just chatting and having a good time hanging out. He knows everything about everything there is to do with ballistics. I'm just a ghetto redneck version trying to <laughs> trying to, trying to learn stuff from him as much as I can. And like I said, uh, I absolutely love your newsletter, and I read every single one of them. So I appreciate those, too. It's, there's always something good in it. And... If it's something that floats your boat too, you do an ammo find thing too. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's always a good, is it come out on Fridays? Is that what the Friday? Usually is? Friday, unless I'm hunting on Friday, then I'll send it out uh, earlier in the week. But if you're in, so this, right, Adam sends out a, uh, basically a new YouTube video every day. I send out an email every day. You know, one's not better than the other. Some people like one more than the other. Some people like both. But if you want to hear from me, a couple hundred words every weekday, learning about hunting, shooting, ballistics, that sort of thing, uh, sort of stuff we talked about tonight, like this week, I was talking about some pros and cons of the 338 Wind Mag with a guy that I know that was hunting in uh, in uh, Europe for Ibex and for Red Stag with the 338 Wind Mag. Some of the situations worked great, others it didn't. Talk about possible reasons that could be, that sort of thing, just some things that you know, like I said, it's just interesting for some people. I enjoy reading it. I enjoy writing mm-hmm. it. Other people enjoy reading it. So go to huntingguns101.com. 
sign up there. You'll get a free ebook from me. They'll put you on my email list. And you'll start getting these emails. Send out four regular ones a week, and then usually a Friday ammo email update. You can also send me requests too. John, I'm looking for seven Rin Mag, 140 gram ballistic silver tip ammo. Help me find it. And uh, if I can help you find it, I'll, I'll send it to you. And then I just send out a general blast of a lot of the popular stuff, anything new and interesting uh, that I found during the week. Ammo shortage is uh, looking a lot better than it was uh, a year or two ago. We're not out of it yet, but it's a lot better. And um, uh, we're starting to see some sales on uh, on ammo too. Prices are starting to go down on, on certain things. And so not only am yep. I trying to help people find stuff, I'm starting to help you find stuff at a good price now. A uh, price that was a lot better, maybe half of what you had been paying a year ago for some of this stuff, man. Yep. Um, I've seen some guns start to come down too, which makes me just as excited. Mm -hmm. I still right. miss the days of being able to go into town and find any ammo I want. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that will ever come back. But I was I was looking at my Midway account the other day from 2018 and 2019, and it almost made me cry what I was paying for ammo back then. One, you could get anything that you wanted, and two, the prices that that uh, that we were paying for. We didn't know how good we had it back then. <laughs> yep, like eight dollars for a box of nine millimeter at Walmart. That's never mm -hmm. going to happen again, I don't think. But yeah, fourteen ninety nine much... for a for a box of Corlock ammo. Yeah, never going to happen again. Now I'm happy to see that at like thirty something bucks. Mm -hmm. So for some of that stuff, you're getting down to the mid twenties now. Like I saw some thirty thirty for like twenty three ninety nine and and that sort of thing. Ooh, so it's that's a good deal. It's going in the right direction with that stuff. That's right. Yeah. So let's let's uh, like I said, sign up there, honeyguns one hundred one dot com. Put you on the email list, Big Game Hunting Podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts. And then the Big Game Hunting Blog.com is my blog. And then the Big Game Hunting Blog on YouTube is my YouTube channel. A lot of the same stuff in, in those three areas. It's just a matter of whether you like reading, watching videos, or listening to it on a podcast. Go, uh, go do it as appropriate for you. Sweet. Awesome. Well, John, it's good to see your face. And I appreciate you coming and hanging out with us on the show tonight i appreciate you big time adam it was a pleasure and an honor being back on the show with you again today i enjoyed it as always we'll do it again sometime so thanks a lot for having me i'll talk to you soon appreciate everybody watching the show yeah.